Well, um, so talking about uh, a project I've been working on for a while now, um, the title is uh, Veraldo, and it is a uh, <coughs> GPU-based volume editor. And uh, just for some background, um, kind of to explain what that means, um, most familiar reference for most people is Minecraft. That's um, maybe the first place you hear the word voxel. Um, the typical approach to rendering these is to, um, it's called indirect volume rendering. So rather than um, <coughs> to, um, uh, so it, it basically it's creating an intermediate representation that um, is used to represent the voxels. So here um, there's different ways to establish um, thresholds for inside and outside and create a mesh there. There's marching cubes, dual contouring, and um, just creating meshes on the faces of voxels uh, that have empty neighbors um, for uh, Minecraft. So <coughs> my uh, project here is um, doing what's called direct volume rendering. So rather than using an intermediate representation, I am um, using that image data as if it were um, sort of a solid thing. Um, there's a high resolution buffer of um, RGBA values and um, there, there's different um, ways to manipulate it. Um, <clears throat> along with that, there's um, a three channel lighting buffer, which um, is used to scale those values and there's different ways to put values in, uh, which I'll explain a little bit later. So <coughs> um, loading and saving is done with basically the same format that you send it to the GPU in. Um, it's enumerated slices. If you were to imagine um, this, this vertical face here is one slice. Um, I'm creating a very tall PNG that is um, slices one after the other kind of vertically listed out. So that's um, a few megabytes versus um, something explicit for every voxel would be um, hundreds of megabytes and that's what it is in GPU memory. So <coughs> um, altogether with 512 resolution um, blocks you're looking at like a couple gigs of GPU usage. It, it does get pretty heavy. Um, <clears throat> so, so, yeah. Does somebody have a question? Oops, sorry. Okay, anyway. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, color is uh, front and back buffer that have uh, RGBA values. And those are 8-bit unsigned integers. Um, masking is a single channel, um, uh, 8 bits. And lighting, same. Um, but I'm going to be converting that to floating point. And uh, there's a couple other changes that are going to come along with that. But um, currently, it's an 8-bit um, unsigned integer. And we'll see later um, where that can kind of clip. And there's some issues there. but. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this idea of masking comes from raster image editors. So <clears throat> there's more flexibility in like Photoshop, but um, in this particular case, um, it's just used to um, signify that this portion of the three-dimensional raster is um, going to retain its value to some degree. So um, if something then draws over it, here, uh, just to illustrate that, I, I have the default initialized XOR texture. Um, and then I've masked off several sections of it. <coughs> On the right, it's a uh, very high value, uh, decreasing to the left. Um, so basically what that looks like is then I, I went over with a just a, a sphere that's large enough to cover the entire volume. Um, and based on the mask value, 
the output or you know the final voxel color value is um, <coughs> is determined based on a blending operation that weights the um, the drawing operation with the existing value there. So <coughs> the ways that uh, those are um, set, there's um, two sort of universal, like sort of Boolean type things here. Um, unmask all or set all to some level and then invert mask, which inverts it. So in <coughs> value of zero becomes 255, 255 becomes zero. Um, this type of thing. Masked by color looks at the values in each of the channels um, and can be used to mask certain ranges. <coughs> this is interesting um, when you have like diffused color with a blur and you sort of establish sort of a threshold there um, based on this. So that's something interesting you can do. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. But um, so any of the drawing primitives have the op option to um, also mask any of the affected voxels. So <clears throat> there's two main classes of drawing operations. And there's the assigned distance field primitive based ones, which use an is inside function, which does a couple other things, which I'll explain. Um, well, we'll get there. But, uh, and then the other uses a separate um, piece of um, <coughs> uh, GPU memory as a uh, load buffer, which uh, copies raster data from the CPU. And copying from that is done in a way that respects the mask. So it's not just directly loading data from the CPU into it, um, your, your front buffer. It's selectively applying it based on the mask. So that's used for loading PNG models that you've saved or um, it's a very cool algorithm. Um, I talked to the guy, um, Brent Wernus. Um, he's a very cool um, look up voxel automata terrain. Um, I'll show you some pictures a little bit later, but uh, it's a very cool uh, noise generation algorithm. <coughs> so the most basic shapes, um, if, um, a, a function that basically says, you know, uh, for my voxel location, am I inside or outside of the shape? So um, axis line bounding boxes or this uh, sort of a cuboid shape that's orientable. Uh, cylinders and tubes, uh, spheres and ellipsoids. Uh, so that's a sphere with um, a couple different um, radii that you can set uh, independent of one another. Um, and you can rotate that too. Uh, rotated grids, um, which I don't have any pictures here, but I'll, um, <coughs> I'll get to one in a second. Um, height maps are very cool. Um, you can see one in the top there. Um, basically uh, comparing, it's a scalable height and it uh, compares the, um, like the Y value of the, uh, the voxel location against a, uh, another texture um, to determine that one. <coughs> So noise on the bottom there, um, I'm using Fast Noise 2, which uh, generates a lot of different um, algorithms, uh, noise algorithms. And basically the way that that's used is there's a user specified upper and lower threshold um, that says, all right, this buffer holds noise values that range between zero and one. I want uh, to affect the ones that are between like 0.7 and 0.9. And that would mark, uh, that would, that would do that, right? So it would, it would, um, any noise value that's red that's between 0.7 and 0.9 is going to be drawn to. So <coughs> triangles, uh, they're based on three points and then, um, basically those three points are in a plane, um, and I create sort of a, uh, like a prism type shape that's um, a little bit above and below that plane. So uh, you can see two of them put together. Um, isosahedron um, is actually composed primitives. It's um, tubes uh, or uh, cylinders actually, 
um, spheres at the points and triangles um, for the faces. Um, and then there's user scripting, which is not quite done yet, but basically you can do some very cool stuff. Um, you can create fractals. Um, you can do some very, I don't actually have very good pictures of that right now, but um, yeah. Um, <coughs> um, a lot of the things on here have been hit with a pretty heavy Gaussian blur. Um, so that's why they look really smooth. Um, so here's just kind of showing what um, these composed primitives do. Um, in the previous picture, you might have seen that um, isosahedron sitting on that piece of landscape. This is just a chunk cut out of the middle. And so basically, <coughs> with the lighting already computed before the slice was taken out, you can kind of see the dark patches where light didn't penetrate as deeply into the object. Um, you can see thinner parts on the faces where uh, light did shine through. So um, <coughs> that's uh, kind of a cool little effect there. And um, so the sort of hazy volume around the, um, around the shape as well uh, is created by putting the alpha value sort of in the lower ranges <coughs> versus uh, putting it at zero for the slice there. Um, there. Um, <clears throat> so the load buffer type of drawing operation, um, these are some uh, voxel automata terrain uh, outputs. Um, so basically, I generate all that voxel data on the CPU, um, put it in a texture, uh, invoke a shader that has some logic um, to do that copying operation. So, um, right, and, and that copying operation um, can either respect the mask or just overwrite everything, uh, depending on the behavior you want. So, um, a couple of utility operations. Um, blurs of adjustable radius. Um, so basically, um, combining my value with my neighbors um, with different weighting. Uh, clearing, similarly to the copying, um, respects the mask value uh, when invoked. Uh, masking operations I talked about earlier. Um, <coughs> the uh, shifting is basically, if I were um, to want to um, uh, translate something into X, Y, or Z, um, and, and have it loop off the edges. So if it's like a, I've, I've heard it described as a torus, but that doesn't really geometrically make sense. Um, just the way that it kind of loops off the edges in all three dimensions. Um, it's, yeah, a little abstract, but basically it just loops off the edges when, um, when something was, uh, would, would translate out of the uh, volume. <coughs> So the operation logging, um, this is actually very cool. This is something I've been working on uh, the past three or four days pretty seriously. Um, Dana, uh, it's, not, it's not exactly done yet, but it's um, basically, the idea is like everything you do in the editor is logged to a list of JSON records of like um, types of operations and all the parameters to that operation. And I can dump that to a text file if I want to replicate something that I've done in the editor. Um, basically, this JSON scripting is like, I can load some formatted input file that says, um, I wanna make an animation. Here's the um, setup. And then there's per frame operations I can specify as well. Um, so that's kind of, it facilitates the making of these um, frame perfect loop looping animations, uh, which is cool. Um, and with the GL read pixels, I can get the, the frame buffer data um, with the, uh, there's a little bit of finagling to get, um, get rid of all the uh, aliasing later. I'll go over that. But basically, once that's all done, I can, um, I can get that image data directly uh, with GL read pixels. So this 
just showing um, <coughs> basically um, you can create a lot of complexity with oriented grids. Um, so this has some animation of the lights over time. It's maybe a little too subtle to see, but um, you know, it's something to work on. Uh, point lights you can animate as well. Um, I don't have any examples of that yet. The other, um, but so basically the way this is achieved was uh, with the default XOR texture in place, I went and masked a sphere at the center. Um, then <coughs> drew every, everything with a clear, uh, and then um, then I unmasked everything. Okay. Then I went through and for the first one of these spheres. Uh, that's colored, I, uh, I masked with a value of 255, and then I inverted the mask. So that is <coughs> basically what that means is inside that sphere is zero, and then everything outside is 255. So then my drawing operations are constrained to the volume of that sphere, right? So sort of a, a constructive solid geometry kind of idea. But um, <clears throat> anyway, do that same thing three times. Um, and because of the way that the whole buffer except for that sphere is masked, um, the drawing operations are constrained only to that sphere. Um, so kind of cool. And then, like I was saying, the per frame operations here um, is a little bit of rotation. And then, um, in this one, some changing lights. So, so the lighting operations, there's um, basically a, a level clear, which basically sets uh, all the whole buffer to some uh, RGB value. Um, and that's, like I say, it's a scale factor for the color data. And that's how um, sun shafts, that type of thing are, um, are represented. Um, the um, <coughs> it looks very flat when you uh, have no lighting on it, right? Because anything that shares a color value, um, there's going to be no depth cues um, unless there's something with some alpha uh, to give you that depth cue. Um, but anyway, um, so these types of lighting create that illusion. Um, things like point lights, cone lights, directional lights. Uh, fake global illumination and neighborhood-based ambient occlusion, and I'll go over each of these. Uh, so the direct lighting is basically, <coughs> it's modeling a, a ray traversing the, uh, the voxel space and being attenuated as it travels, um, where attenuation is just a, um, the signal is decreased in magnitude, right? So it's, it's becoming dimmer as it, as it hits uh, opaque objects. Um, so the, the amount that it's affected is, um, it's, so the alpha channel value is raised to a power, um, and this is to give you more usable range. Um, the same way that I, uh, I do later in the alpha blending for the, um, <coughs> for the, uh, color data. So the, um, uh, for the direct lighting shader invocation is per voxel. And basically for a point, it's got a point in space that represents the light location. And it's going to sample the alpha values in between um, the light location and the voxel that this shader invocation represents. And then uh, consider the distance. Once all the attenuation is uh, computed, um, there's another attenuation that happens to model the inverse square law which is like a, a one over distance squared. Anyway, um, <coughs> the directional lights uh, specify like a uniform direction that the light originates from for every voxel. Um, and that's done with two angles uh, here, um, just the azimuth and the altitude. Um, I call them theta and um, omega, I think I don't, I don't remember. But um, just two angles, and uh, that's sort of general enough. Uh, 
Um, so fake global illumination, it's not very good fake global Ill illumination, but it's um, kind of a real-time approximation. Um, it's invoked in um, slices down the y-axis, um, top to bottom, right? Um, and, and there is synchronization in between each slice, so it is not exactly the fastest thing in the world. Um, so basically, each cell in each slice, horizontal slice, uh, considers nine rays going upwards, and that's to, you know, uh, if you kind of look at it from above, it's it's the whole neighborhood above it. Um, <clears throat> to the so it's going from that voxel's location to those nine voxel locations, and so each of those rays has some contribution to the final lighting. Um, if it hits something that's opaque, it's um, it takes some of the light from that opaque object, and if it escapes the volume before it hits anything opaque. It's going to use a sky color um, as its contribution to the lighting. And so all those are averaged, and then that's what's applied. Um, <clears throat> so neighborhood-based ambient occlusion is very similar to the Gaussian blur, um, the way that the alpha values are weighted. Um, it's kind of like a... Mm, Almost like the inverse square law thing too. It's it's like one over the distance squared kind of a thing. Um, if you, if you consider the the middle one as like an origin point, um, so we're determining an alpha fraction that is the sum of all the sampled alpha values over the maximum possible alpha values uh, that you could see if all samples were, you know, at some maximum value. Um, here, two fifty five. And so <clears throat> the, the light in the buffer is then decreased um, by multiplying it by uh, one minus this fraction. Um, yeah, so I've got one here with um, <clears throat> some lighting data uh, applied to it. Um, you can see a little bit of aliasing, which is kind of the next big thing I'm working on is uh, multi-sampling in the voxels for the shapes. So like um, you can kind of see on the faces of some of these grids where um, there's rough spots where um, it's, it's just aliasing. You can see some lines there. Um, anyway, um, but this is a good demonstration of the uh, attenuation of um, light through a sort of a transparent, um, just a, a low alpha volume and um, kind of the appearance of that and, and the way that the light also diffuses into things that have kind of a medium alpha. Um, if it's strong enough, it sort of penetrates the, um, the sort of uh, the, the grid there. And so it, it, like, like I was saying, the um, <coughs> rotated grids uh, very quickly uh, create some uh, very complex uh, kinds of structures, uh, which I think is very cool. Um, and so this one is zoomed way in to kind of give you <clears throat> a better view of this aliasing um, and kind of give you a sense of the scale of the voxels. Uh, this is done with nearest sampling, where typically I do um, MIT mapped nearest sampling. So you can see individual voxel borders a little better here. Um, <clears throat> but so this is another. Um, um, this is the same volume, um, so you can kind of see the same sorts of features. And on the surfaces of the grids, you can see that same sort of uh, issue that multi-sampling might be uh, useful for. Um, so the, the rendering, um, basically, um, you can think of it logically as if it were taking place in the fragment shader. Um, and so basically, that's per pixel, right? Um, each pixel considers a ray computed from GL frag uh, cord, um, goes out into space, tests against an axis aligned bounding box that contains all the voxel data. If it hits, I know where the near and far intersection points are, and I can continue. If it misses, I, uh, I know that 
there's nothing to be done. I didn't hit the volume and I just uh, used the OpenGL clear color. Um, the invocations that hit, uh, they basically, they're gonna look through that volume. And I found this <laughs> very appropriate uh, picture on, on uh, Wikipedia, just was looking for a, a picture that was uh, samples along the ray. <laughs> um, somebody had made this, it wasn't, it's on Wikipedia, but it's not on any page, which is interesting. But um, anyway. Uh, so basically, alpha blending is done by taking these samples and back to front, compositing them over one another um, to create the final output color. And there's probably room for optimization there if you go front to back, um, but the alpha blending uh, equation that I found was for over uh, uh, compositing. So like I say, there's um, probably some way to uh, make that a little better. If you um, were to composite forward, you could stop at some threshold maybe. Um, so anyway, some of the optimizations that have kind of developed over the past few versions of this. There's a render texture that really enables a lot of a lot of things. Um, so the dimensions are basically uh, kind of set at compile time. But you have this super sampling factor that says, um, all right, I have this render texture. How many times higher is that the resolution of that texture going to be than my screen's re resolution? So less than one means there's less than one pixel behind each output pixel, correspondingly greater than one. Um, you have super sampling, right? Um, but this makes it flexible enough that I can use it on my laptop with an Intel integrated graphics chip or on my desktop with a, you know, pretty serious Radeon card. So this is like, you know, kind of a cool application for this. Um, <clears throat> but so the flexibility to use the, the, those different resolutions um, when you wouldn't necessarily be able to, um, okay. So imagine um, you went to a really big texture well, then maybe you're, um, when, you, when you call uh, the, the function to dispatch the compute shader, um, there's some maximum value for each dimension. Um, basically, the way I got around that is uh, I, I made a tile-based renderer that um, just goes in squares, um, 256 on a side and fills up that texture, basically. Um, there's no synchronization in between each of them, so it's very fast, because um, they're all independent. So basically, um, another thing from the render texture is that you don't necessarily need to um, update it every uh, frame, right? So it's potentially the same data, right? So it's just kind of busy work to be recomputing all that alpha blending, all that stuff again. So basically what I'm doing is reading the final result back from the render texture, uh, unless something changes. Um, and so to take advantage of the super sampling and this actually, it's kind of cool. Um, this is um, enabled a lot. Um, sorry, the, um, <coughs> this has gotten rid of a lot of aliasing and and created a really very smooth image, I think, uh, at this point. Um, so basically, um, the when this sampling is done, right, to, to put the pixels on the screen, I have a triangle that covers the entire screen, but then I'm sampling the render texture with linear filtering, and um, I'm using a multi-sample buffer when sampling. So I'm actually, I have offset samples uh, that I'm blending to get the final output color. And <clears throat> kind of playing with like the idea of doing some dithering uh, at that stage, because that's that's where I do my tone mapping. And that all kind of rolls into that floating point um, lighting texture thing. And it's a little bit complicated. If anybody's interested, I could talk your ear off about it later. But um, the uh, the basic idea is that um, you've got a lot of data that um, 
generates the output pixel. Um, it's a, a lot of it's all, it's all averaged together uh, to get that final color. So um, pretty basic libraries. Um, that's DL2 for windowing and input handling. Um, I only need uh, 4.1 uh, for compute shaders and uh, image load store. Um, uh, GL3W is a replacement for glue. Um, and I have the source for it, which has actually proved helpful at least twice. Um, um, yeah, so dear MGUI, I moved to the docking branch just recently. Um, there's some very cool features with that. Um, GLM for vectors. Um, <coughs> Fast noise 2 I mentioned before. Uh, they've got a very cool, um, uh, very configurable noise generation. Um, library there if you want to check it out. <coughs> uh, and then there's load PNG for uh, PNG, uh, like input and output. Um, then just the JSON library. And this is kind of an example of like what those formatted um, um, function calls look like. So if I wanted a, a Gaussian blur of some radius n, that's kind of what that looks like. And uh, again, I uh, encourage you to look at uh, Brent Wernis's uh, Box a lot of monitoring. It's a very cool um, thing. I basically his implementation was in processing, and I converted it to C plus plus, and um, made sort of a header out of it. Um, so I had to, <laughs> actually quite a bit of finagling with this because um, Java has a built-in um, like unlimited number of bits kind of number system. It's it's like um, they call it big int. Anyway, it's arbitrarily um, large integers, and it's it's used to encode rules for um, this noise algorithm. Anyway, um, so there's a little bit to that if you do actually want to use it. Um, so yeah, that's everything. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd um, <coughs> be happy to answer them. Have you thought about using some sort of background image or cube map, 3D map, whatever, so that instead of sampling the clear color when you have whenever the ray gets through the volume, you instead sample from that image? It's actually a very cool idea. Yeah, that, that might be worth looking into. Uh, I, hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't considered that. The um, Something I had thought about recently was um, uh, the the initial uh, ray generation, um, doing some sort of either perspective projection or trying to do like a I don't know, so like a like a lens curvature to it. Uh, that was leading into my next idea or thought was, can we like put a snow globe model around it so we get this? It, it frames the uh, volume so it isn't just petering out into space, but like as a inside of a you know glass sphere, and then you're talking about doing lens lenses and then you could throw that in there yeah hmm. a lot of potential i so there was something on the graphics programming discord recently that was uh i think it was today actually the um ember gen i don't know if you've seen that um <laughs> i mean they're they're doing like volumetric simulation type stuff with rendering that's like this kind of stuff so it's it's really very impressive um, but animated volumes like that. Yeah, I, I saw that and it, it, it looks really cool. But it definitely seems to be, um, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's not voxel based. Yeah, that's the link here. Do we want to? Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, um, well, I was like, let's finish this, the, what we're talking about here, so we can end the recording instead of getting distracted. Yeah. For sure. Um, I can do a demo uh, if you guys want to see uh, something. Sure. Also. I was also curious, uh, like, is there anything causing the, like, kind of like fog you have going most of them, or do you just kind of have a bunch of, like, transparent values? So, yeah, uh, that, that sort of volume uh, fog there. Um, um, that's, yeah, so that's uh, kind of ranges of uh, alpha values kind of in between like three and seven. Um, 
so it's yeah it's just um that's a kind of very transparent end of the alpha scale there okay that's cool it's a really really cool effect yeah i, I dig it yeah Sorry, I just had to fix one thing. So, have, have you guys thought of um, like using some um, acceleration data structures for 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 the triangles itself, and then trying to um, run the rays from that? So, there's no, there's one triangle. Pardon? There's only ever one triangle, so there's no meshing. No, there's no meshing at all. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, it's the the um, it's it's called direct volume rendering. So you're um, you're you're compositing samples of RGBA data inside okay. of that volume. So it's all in a cube. Right. Yeah. It's all inside that uh, three dimensional texture. Okay. Great. Okay. So cool to do stuff like uh like depth of field and stuff like that. That, that would be cool. Really to nice. Well, I do have MipMap set up, so it might be something I could do to um, blend with a higher um, MipMap level uh, to do that blurring. I I don't know much about MipMaps. I uh, <laughs> I have MipMap samplers, but that's just about. <laughs> Do you have any like a uh, kind of like end goals for this project or? It's been constantly evolving. <laughs> um, it's kind of been part of my uh, growth as uh, computer graphics programming. I, I don't know. It's really, um, it's turned into quite something, I think. <laughs> um, let me see if I can change which screen this points to. Awesome. Cool. <clears throat> so um, this is the default initialization. Uh, it's an XOR uh, texture. Um, this is kind of a classic um, computer graphics thing. That's like each of the, if you were to look at like um, texel coordinates, um, they're um, um, in the range of uh, 0 to 256, uh, or in this case, 512. Um, they, um, so basically it's that number considered as a, a binary number, um, X ordered with, you know, so it's X, Y, and Z is X ordered, and that sets the level for that pixels content. So it's, I don't know, just kind of a classic test pattern. Um, but it's, uh, just something to, uh, <laughs> show that it's working, I guess. Because that's been an issue. I've been trying to get it to build on Windows and um, only had limited success there. Um, basically, um, one of the, the primary things there is um, it'll show up, but uh, I think the latest I've sort of figured out is that um, it sets up incomplete textures. So there's no allocation of a buffer behind that texture. Um, so that may be some indication of how to fix it. I think that. Um, it had been done with like null initialization, but then I think I think if I give it data, it allocates something, hopefully. So that's something I have to um, get a hold of somebody with a Windows computer and try again. Um, but yeah, so basically, um, say I want to do some uh, mask this and. Um, And so basically that's um, cut out a height map. So we draw on a height map and then, um, um, and, and that first height map is masked and then um, uh, drew another one that has zero alpha um, and that didn't mark over this, uh, these voxels that were masked. So basically if I clear the light and then do a point light sort of in the middle, um, you'll be able to kind of see what goes on with that. And uh, 
interface may be not ideal, but um, yeah, you can kind of see the uh, way that shines out from that center point there. And shines through alpha values to varying degrees. Um, direct lighting, again, that's the two angles. Um, so you can kind of, uh, Yeah, and then um, <laughs> no, that's pretty if, good. if anybody wants to see anything in particular, um, I could honestly just mess around with this for <laughs> some period of time. Um, Are the height maps the, uh, always drawn from the bottom up, or can you do like 3D noise or something like that? So, uh, <laughs> good question. Um, yeah. So I have a couple different generation algorithms, but they are um, all just drawn up the y-axis right now. Um, yeah, so yeah, you did pick up on that. Uh, <laughs> the um, the other, the voxel automated terrain, I have it set up so that uh, you specify which faces to fill. Um, so yeah, there's no reason why it couldn't be like you're suggesting, um, you know, you know, from whatever direction. <laughs> Um, so let me kind of give you some indication of what that looks like. So, um, and this actually will take a second because it's generating, um, what is it, like 100 million samples or something? Uh, 100, 100 million voxels? Um, Right, and oh, that actually was still masked, masked so um, not mask all, and then uh, do that again. Uh, but basically, this is um, uh, just kind of a way to get some really exotic patterns in there um, that you can do cool stuff with uh, the rest of everything here. Let's see what we got here. So there's something interesting. Um, and that's uh, um, kind of maybe what that looks like. So um, does anybody have any questions um, about anything or? Um, Just admiring the <laughs> really cool pictures. That's pretty cool. I, yeah. I have. Um, I I'm writing up a um, uh, thing for my website about this, um, which I'll put in the um, the graphics programming uh, meetup um, Discord if you guys want to see it. Um, oh yes. I have absolutely. a re I have a research paper kind of thing that I wrote. Um, about it too. It's kind of in the style of an academic paper, but it's not. Um, it's not finished, and a lot of details need to be kind of rehashed. But um, yeah, that that might be. Uh, I'll, I'll link that now, actually. So for each of the voxels, um, the yeah, the coordinates. Um, are actually varying from zero to to n and whatever um, in x, y, and z, correct? So yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, there's something uh, called a Morton code. You Morton could code. Use, you could use something like that. I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't. Um, um, Exactly remember, but I know that it can be used because um, your X, Y, Z axis go from zero, uh, to and and then based on that, because of that, it forms a code. You know, each each um, 
vertex actually in the 3D volume forms a particular code of uh, with the, right. Um, I mean, I, I'm just throwing up ideas of of, of what you could, uh, what one can. Maybe, maybe I, uh, something which I'd like to. Maybe I'll take a look at your. your if you um, and, if you look at um, if you look up something called the shear warp algorithm, S H E A R uh, yeah, W A R P. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's something that um, treats the space in a very similar way. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I don't know a huge amount about that, but I, I do have some little bit of familiarity with it. Okay, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll, I'll look that up, and maybe I'll take a look at your um, your GitHub and see whether I can put in. Yeah, the, everything on the GPU is uncompressed, um, right. so it's all it's all explicitly stored voxels. Um, right. So those are, yeah.